We praise you, Lord.
church pew, but for the first time I can really see Jesus paid the price for my freedom, and I don't have any more chains holding me. Hallelujah. 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 Bless you, Lord. I'll never forget the day your love came down on me. Thank you, Lord. For your mercy, your mercy, your mercy, your mercy, Lord. I want everybody to just lift your voice and let's praise the Lord. Come on. Lift your voice and praise him. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. We bless you, Lord. Come on, praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Jesus, we bless you, Jesus, we bless you, Jesus, we bless you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Glory to your name, Jesus. We praise you. 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 We praise you.
church. Father, into your courts. Into your courts. We now enter, Lord. Many of you are, are here. Looks like from Missouri. I'm partial to Missouri. That's my home state. St. Louis. But if you live in St. Louis, it's St. Louis, so it's different. You know. It's good to have you. How many of you are here from Missouri? How many of you here, you're kind of hanging over from the youth conference? Awesome. How many of you that are not here for the youth conference and haven't been here for the, but you're here for a revival tonight, it's your first time? Look at you. Well, welcome. Hey, man. Welcome. I just want to clue you into what we're about to do. Um, First of all, we have no clue what we're about to do. Some of you who came in early, you, you heard music play and you saw people waving banners and just didn't want you to get freaked out by that. That's some of our intercessory prayer people. And, you know, we just kind of like waving a big hanky before the Lord. I don't know what it does, but if it gets his attention any better, give me a big banner. But... But our pastor was scheduled to speak tonight, and he's had a very, very trying week. It's been a very difficult week. Some things have happened here. We've had a death in our church. And we've had some real pastors been going day and night, and he's exhausted. And so he's kind of recharging his batteries tonight. 
Uh, we gave him the night off. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but uh, he wanted me to say, he wanted me to tell all of you visitors that we're so glad you're here. And he will be here Sunday morning, recharged and refired and ready to go. So he will be preaching on Sunday morning. He called yesterday afternoon and, and asked if, if I would prepare something. And, and so then I called Dr. Larry Martin from the School of Ministry, and he's got something prepared. And uh, Richard can't do anything because he ain't got no voice. Uh, but we really don't know what we're going to do. We're prepared. We've got sermons. We're prepared for that. But just to clue you in on what God's been doing, we are in our eighth year of revival at Brownsville. Just a couple weeks ago, we celebrated our seventh anniversary. And what you heard in this baptistry is just a sampling of what God's been doing for about seven years now. And we just still don't understand it, but we love it. We love it. And as we, were, as we were there worshiping and I was hearing these testimonies, I began to think that God might just want to, God's been increasing his glory here just lately. There's been an increase of his glory in this place. There's been an increase of miracles and healings. There's been an increase of conviction of sin. God has seemingly, seemingly increased everything. And tonight as they were baptizing these young folks, I just felt waves of his spirit coming across this place and many of you are here tonight and you heard these testimonies and you're saying Lord could that be me could you touch me that way and I want to guarantee you that if you'll open your heart if you'll open your life right now before you leave this service you will be totally changed God will begin a process You say, Lindell, is God going to set me free and deliver me from all my vices in one fail swoop? He can do that, and he's done that for some of us. But some of us had so much that he just started the process, and took it, take, it's taken him several years. He just keeps pulling stuff out, but making us closer to him. And those of you who've been touched in the Branded by Fire conference this week, and you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, tonight you need to receive the power of the Holy Ghost. You need to be baptized in the Spirit. So, we don't do second heaven warfare too much here at Brownsville. We don't curse devils too much. We just worship. And we believe that over this church, there's an open heaven. And as we worship the Lord, the heavens open wider and wider because he opens up because it's so rare that he gets worship in his house. Because most of his house goings on are about us. But when we start focusing our attention on him, I believe he begins to open the heavens over us so he can receive our praise and he can receive our worship. And when God begins to come into the, pre in, the in, in the house and begins to move, things happen. So what I want you to do for the next few minutes, I don't know how long, I don't know what we're going to do. We may preach, we may not. It, we're ready for anything. But I want you to lift your faith right now and begin to reach out to the Lord and begin to worship him. We've sang a few entrance songs here to kind of get you in, in the door. And uh, we, I don't know what we're going to sing next. I have no clue. I don't have a list. For seven years, I've come up here without a list. We've came up prepared in our hearts, but not knowing what the Lord wants to do. Right now, I want you to let your expectancy rise. Young folks who've been in branded by fire this week, God began a process in you. He wants to take it a step further tonight. He wants to take it a step further tonight. Are you ready? I said, are you ready? What do you say we worship him like we've never worshiped him before? Turn loose and let's give God glory and honor and let's praise him. Will you think that'd be okay? All right, good. We probably should just get this out of our system because we got a lot of young folks here. So, uh, well, I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. Y'all, come on. Took back what he stole from me. Took back what he stole from me. I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me.
Jesus. Taught the sun where to stand in the morning. <laughs> I love you, Jesus. And who told the ocean you can only come this far? And who showed the
This worship is for you, Lord. And I Like the fields wait for the dew from heaven, I wait on you. Like a thirsty man in a desert waits on water, I wait on you. You're the hope of my whole life, and I worship you. While I wait on you, I worship you.
worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Worship the Lord in the beauty, in the beauty of holiness. spirit voice right now worship him come on church worship him worship him
Yes! Yes! Come on, lift your voice. Yes! We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. You turn a bunch of worshipers loose in one room, you're in trouble. Praise the Lord of hosts. Yes, we do. Hallelujah. We praise the Lord of hosts. Hallelujah. seated. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> we're going to receive an offering and we're going to turn, I think, Brother Larry loose because I really feel like what the Lord has given me is not a sermon, but I'm going to read you my scripture. And I want you to hear in case you didn't know, there is something happening in our nation. I said, in case you didn't know, there's something happening in our nation. Some of you tonight, you entered freely into the worship and you go, I love this. Other of you, some of you were uncomfortable. Some of you were bored. Because worship doesn't entertain the flesh. Anybody can worship. Anybody can praise the Lord. Now, I know we call it praise and worship. But anyone can offer an exuberant shout to the Lord. You don't have to even know him to do that. Because trees do that. The oceans do that. The hawk that sits on the post outside my window in my backyard and eats mice off the field worships the Lord. In the very fact of his creation, the scripture says, if you don't praise him, the rocks will. Do you think the rocks know him? Not like you do. They're just created. Did you know that you can even have sin in your life and praise the Lord. I know that because I've seen church people do it for years. But if you ever really want to get to know his ways, and if you ever want to get past where you are right now, you must become a worshiper. And worshipers are not just people who play instruments. There are people who come to the house of the Lord with an offering, not necessarily always a monetary offering, but they come with something to give to the Lord. They come with something to pour on Him. They come with the intention of filling Him up. I said they come with the intention of filling God up. 
All of you who were touched at conference this week, branded by fire, you've got to become a worshiper or you won't last. Because when you get to know the Lord, the closer you get to Him, the more He pours of Himself into you and the less like the old you you look. Not because you made a decision or you made up your mind to be a Christian, but because a worshiper begins to look like what he worships. I said a worshiper starts looking like what he worships. If you worship food, you start looking like what you worship. I happen to know that myself. If you like a particular basketball star, you start trying to get a haircut like him. If you like a rock star, God help us. All those girls whose shirts aren't quite long enough. You start looking like those girls whose shirts aren't quite long enough. Whatever you love and worship, you start to look like. Well, it just so happens that as you worship the Lord, not just praise Him, not just declare who He is. When someone stands up in the MTV Awards and says, I want to thank God that He gave me the ability to sing, they're praising the Lord. They may or may not know him, but they're praising him. But when you're alone, and the way you live, and the things you hunger after, show if you're a worshiper. A lot of folks in the church aren't worshipers. They want all the stuff of God, but they don't want him. It's kind of like deciding to marry a rich man, and you want his car, his house, but you don't really want to have him. Let me let you in on a little secret. When you marry him, you get all of it. The money, the car, the house, the bad breath, the bad manners, and all the stuff that goes along with him. Bad moods, good moods, happy moods, because whatever you worship, you become. Whatever you marry yourself to. And a worshiper becomes married to the Lord. My hope is that those of you in this room tonight will take worship out of that little bitty category. You've got it plugged in so conveniently in your religious mind. You got it plugged into a three or four chorus song, and, and, and it bothers you when we get into worship and we sing too long. You aren't going to like heaven at all. Because, Dr. Martin, I believe the last time I read the Bible, when we get to heaven, we won't preach anymore. When we get to heaven, we won't prophesy anymore. There won't be any healing lines in heaven. I said there won't be any healing lines in heaven. But the Bible does say that there is going to be a number no man could number. With a loud and mighty voice, lifting up worship to the Lord, the Lamb that was slain who sits on the throne forever and ever and ever. And the 24 elders will throw their crowns down, and they'll do a Brownsville thing. They'll fall on the floor and worship he who sits on the throne. Glory to God. Let me get my scripture. I know I'm not supposed to preach. Boy, it's going to be easy to preach tonight. You hear me? This house is rocking. Glory to God. Wish I was preaching. Maybe I ought to. No, I'm kidding. Well, well, I'm actually going to receive an offering. I want to read to you a scripture that I've been chewing on today and, and just kind of accidentally, I knew it was in there and I've read it before, but I kind of bumped into it. And it just brought me to life. It's found in Isaiah, the fifth chapter, the first verse. And in my little Bible, it says above the fifth 
chapter, it says, the song of the vineyard. I thought that's real interesting. It says this, I will sing for the one I love. <laughs> Me too. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. He looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. This is an allegory of God and Israel, of course. But I want to bring it into our lives as we receive this offering. How much more does God have to do for you before you start yielding some fruit? How many more times are you going to get saved? How many more times are you going to leave branded by fire and go home and grab a hold of all those things, friends, and influences that you've had every time before? I heard testimonies tonight that said, I rededicated my life. That's a nice way of saying, I backslid. And I needed to get right with God again. The Lord has done nothing but good for us. We're sitting in his house in this little seaside town of Pensacola. And guess what? To my knowledge, we don't have an anthrax break out here. We haven't had a bomb dropped or, or a suicide bomber in Cordova Mall. God has been good to us. We're in the middle of a war, but our city has remained basically untouched by the war. We're in a war. Did you know that in America? We're in a war. We don't act like it, but we are. Did you know that your breathing and your heart will beat one more time tonight because God is merciful to you? Do you understand that this evening when you came to church, you put your shoes on, you may have tied them or you may have just slid your feet into them, but do you realize that tonight the morgue could take those shoes off of you. But for the mercy and grace of the Lord. Do you understand that? Surely the Lord has been good. Did you know that God sent his son to give you his life so that you can walk in freedom? So that that ping pong effect and that up and down effect that one of the girls was talking about in the, in the Baptist, baptistry tonight, do you know that doesn't have to happen to you? Do you know that you can live in a victorious place? Did you know you can walk in righteousness? Did you know that Jesus not only sent, not only came to save you, but did you also know that he came to heal you? Do you also know that by his stripes you were healed 2,000 years ago when he took the stripes? Did you know that Jesus said greater things you'll do than I did because I'm going to the Father? Did you know that he made a promise that he was going to send the Holy Ghost and that you would receive power to be witnesses. Did you know that? Did you know that you've been living way beneath what God has for you for a long time? Did you know that he promised us no matter what we go through, we'd never be alone because the Comforter would come? And do you know what he wants from you? Your heart your affection, your admiration, your devotion. I ask you again, how much more has he got to do to get that from you? He bought you with a price. He bought the vineyard. He planted the seed of the word. He planted good vines in you. 
he built a watchtower, the Holy Spirit, over you to make sure all the crows stayed out of your vineyard, to make sure all the rabbits didn't eat the leaves before they were ready to go. He placed you in good soil. But the scripture says, but the crop yielded only bad fruit. Now, this is not a condemning word. It's a word of change. That's my sermonette. Let me ask you something. Why don't you give him what he wants? Why don't you give him what he wants? You're not going to find what you're looking for out there. You're going to find it right here in his presence, in his sanctuary. And some of you who are uncomfortable, what I want you to do is do, will you do me a favor? Go home, put yourself on a CD of worship. See, I grew up Pentecostal, and so if, matter of fact, I grew up around mostly the Church of God in Christ, which is a black denomination, and I just wish I would, could sing like that. I just don't have it. I'm kind of, it's kind of sick when it comes out of me, but I try. But I love it so much. But I grew up with a lot of praise and a lot of, a lot of declaration of the Lord. But I grew up with very little worship. We talked about him, and we talked about how we were getting ready to worship him. <laughs> we sang about, boy, you're getting ready to get it, God. We're fixing to give it to you. I mean, we're getting ready. To, I mean, we've come into this house, and we're in this same. We're going to do it now. Look out. Here it comes. And I think God just kind of sat up on the edge of the throne and went, oh, okay. All right. Yeah. All right. I'm ready. I'm ready. Lord, I mean, God, we're, I mean, we're in the sanctuary. We're going to lift her. I mean, we're here it comes. You get ready. By the way, did you know the Lord saved me and set me free? And uh, Get ready, Lord. Hold on just a second. I want to tell about what you've done for me. And God said, okay, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, uh-huh. And what I've purposed in my heart and what you need to purpose in your heart is go home, stick a CD on or just nothing. Get in the middle of the floor of a room and dim the lights and shut off all the TVs and say, now, Lord, I'm here to give you yours. If you never do one more thing for me, you've done enough. I'm going to tell you, Lord, here is yours. And I mean just start getting gushy. Some of you big old tough men, you know, go home and just get gushy with God. Just start start talking about him start talking about how big he is and how strong he is and how wonderful he is will you do that now I told you i had a sermonette that took me 10 15 minutes i'm done glory to god oh that's religious right there i can i can still do oh glory you got to bounce three times though glory hallelujah I'm pretty good at that, aren't I? It took me years of church to learn how to do that. I can even do the ghost. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. Now, I want to receive an offering tonight, not just worship to the Lord, but I want to receive your offering of your substance, what you've made by working, what you've made by the labor of your hands. And I want to clarify that what I'm about to receive is not your tithing. If you don't go to Brownsville, don't put your tithes in here because that's the Lord's money and it belongs where...
Bless the Lord. Woo. Hallelujah. You may be seated tonight. Thank you so very much. Amen. I, uh, I uh, like, uh, like, totally like, enjoyed like those baptisms tonight. Ain't nothing like young people, amen? Well, there's some advantages and disadvantages to being the standby substitute preacher. <clears throat> you, you just never quite get over the nervousness. <laughs> when, when our first Gemini astronaut took a walk in space, they were totally unprepared for that. They had no way to practice or whatever, and... He got out there in, in midair and found out that if he twisted a knob, his entire body turned a circle just when he twisted a knob. And they had nothing for him to hold on to. And it was so stressful, they really, the, the man manning the spaceship thought he was going to die and called him back into the capsule. And when they finally landed on the earth, they poured a pound and a half of water out of both of his boots. That's what you call sweating in your boots. That's what I've been doing tonight, sweating in my boots. Now, the advantage is when you're the substitute preacher and they announce and say, well, pastor's not going to be here tonight, everybody just kind of goes, ah. And you're expected then to strike out. So if you can just get to first base... You don't have to hit a home run. If you can just get to first base, it was good. I had a guy at minister's conference last week, a pastor. I was preaching on Wednesday morning, and a pastor came up to me one of the nights during the session, and he said, he said, uh, you know you have preconceived ideas, and he said, when, when they introduced you, <clears throat> I thought, well, this is going to be a boring session. He went, on to, he went on to compliment me, but I'm thinking, you know, I could have lived without that. <laughs> Brother Richard, I've spent 49 years thinking I looked at least moderately interesting. <laughs> and at this late date, I have to find out that I look boring. <laughs> Praise God. I need lots of help tonight. Brother Richard has lost his voice. This is what I need y'all to do. I need y'all to watch him. When he does that, I want y'all to say, come on. All you can do better than that. That's it. We're ready now. <laughs> Two very special people. This is their last night at Brownsville. Uh, Alfredo and Sylvia are going back to Italy. They plan to start a ministry in Milano. I want them to stand tonight. <laughs> Graduates of our school. <laughs> Those of you that are close, just reach over there and put your hands on. Alfredo and Sylvia, let's just pray anointing on them and that God will send a breakthrough to Italy. Would you just lift your voices right now and pray for them? Father God, in the name of Jesus, we're so thankful, Lord, for this family. We thank you, Lord, for their trip to Brownsville. We thank you, Lord, for their years at BRSM. We thank you, Lord, how they blessed us, Lord, and we ask you now to bless them. We ask you, Lord, that the power of the Holy Ghost would go before them, Lord, and establish a mighty revival church in Italy, Lord. Raise this couple up to do a great end-time work. Lord, we praise you and give you glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20.
I thought I would preach this message last Sunday morning. I didn't think I would be preaching it tonight. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20 says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding... Am I at the right place? Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Turn to your neighbor and say, you ain't seen nothing yet. It seems on the surface that this text I read is redundant when God says exceeding abundantly because both words kind of mean the same thing from the same word. To excel is to do great. To abound is to do great. So it seems like God is saying the same thing over in a different way. But let me tell you what God is saying. God is saying that what he is doing now might be abundant. But what God is about to do exceeds abundant. Woo! It might be abounding today, but tomorrow it's going to exceed, exceed abounding because everything God does now is better than what God used to do. God always saves the best for the last. How many of you have ever heard people talk about the good old days? Oh, back in the good old days. I remember the good old days. I remember going to church when there wasn't air conditioning. How many of you remember funeral home fans? Little fans with a stick on them. That was air conditioning back in the good old days. I remember hard slap pews from the good old days. Back in the good old days, I was preaching an open air meeting one time in a brush arbor, and a bug <laughs> found its way under the brush arbor and into my mouth that was wide open. <laughs> and I felt the crunch. but I was too deep in the anointing to stop and spit it out. I just lived by the scripture, he was a stranger and I took him in. I remember the good old days. Let me tell you something about those days. Things always get better the further from them you are. Both in distance and in time. But to hear some folks talk about it today, you would think that you and I that live in this new millennium are left with God's second best. That we're like God's grandchildren, that he gave all of the best away and We've got the leftovers. Hear the word of the Lord tonight. God doesn't have any grandchildren. God only has children. So let me tell you again, everything God does is better than the way he did it before. I used to talk about the best revival I ever preached when I was a young man preaching revival in a little place in Tennessee, just a little cross in the roads, we'd put up a, a sort of a tent. It wasn't really a tent. We didn't have the money for a tent. But we'd put up a tarpaulium on sticks, and my, we had a revival. People came out of the hills and the hollows, and God moved, and many were saved, and many were baptized in the Holy Ghost. And for years, I talked about that. I said, that was the greatest revival I ever preached. Then in 19... 96, God changed my life and called me back into evangelistic ministry. I remember going down to a 
little church in Oklahoma to preach a revival. And, and I hadn't preached a revival in a long time, but I was preaching a revival and God showed up. I mean, God showed up. And people started getting saved and started getting baptized in the Holy Ghost and, and started manifesting the power of God. And, and people were shaking under the power of the Lord. And, 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 and this church wasn't anywhere ready for that kind of stuff. I mean, they were not revival prepared. They didn't have a, a wheelchair to get people out to their car. I remember all we could find, this lady was so under the power, there's no way she'd get to the car by herself. And we found a chair in the secretary's office and it had wheels on it. So we're going to get this woman out of the church and out to her car and we put her on this chair. Only problem was it didn't have any arms on it. And so we put her in a chair and she'd shake off one side in the floor. We'd prop her back up and she'd shake off the other side in the floor. It was the power of God. I'm talking about people who had never been to Pensacola, people that had never seen what revival in Pensacola looked like. When God showed up, revival looked just like revival looked here. It was a definite move of the Spirit of God. And I said, mm-hmm, this looks like revival to me. This is the best revival I've ever preached. And then I was in another revival that was better than that revival. And then I was in another revival that was better than that revival. And I began to think about it. And let me tell you tonight, the best revival I ever preached wasn't in Tennessee or Oklahoma or Missouri. The best revival I ever preached is in the future because what God is going to do tomorrow, oh, glory be to God. What God, huh? what God is going to do tomorrow will far exceed anything that God has done yet. The best is yet to come. There's a pattern to all of this. Think about the works of God. Think about creation. Yes, I do believe in creation. God made the monkeys. <laughs> you ever watch monkeys? Somewhat like going to the mall. <laughs> when I was a kid growing up, we used to go to Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, to the Lincoln Park Zoo. And they had a boat out there that the monkeys played on. And they would swing and, oh, it's so entertaining to watch the monkeys. Imagine when God made the monkeys. The angels must have said, my, look at those things. Look how clever those monkeys are. Look at all they can do. Oh, God's outdone himself now. <laughs> One angel nudged the other and said, God can't top that. But then God took the dust of the air, dust of the ground, the air of his breath. Some people think we came from monkeys because we look a little bit alike, you know. <laughs> they got two legs, we got two legs. Let me tell you why we look a little bit like monkeys. The same one made both of us. You see, a Ford and a Lincoln look alike. They both got doors and tires and windshields because the same people make them. But if you don't think there's any difference in a Ford and a Continental, I'll trade you my Escort <laughs> for your Lincoln any day. Just because there's some similarity doesn't mean we came from monkeys. God took the dust and he blowed into the nostrils of man and man became a living soul. I can hear the angels saying, oh, God did it now. God did it now. Listen to me. The ugliest man you've ever saw is prettier than a monkey.
You know, Brother Donnie, stand up. Y'all probably don't know this, but his parents, they weren't planning to name him Donnie. They'd planned to give him a biblical name. From the book of Luke and Acts, they were going to call him Theophilus. Because when he was born, they said he was Theophilus thing they'd ever seen in their life. Somebody break that off of him now. Break that off of him. A woman, a woman was on a bus and she's crying. And this guy says, ma'am, why are you crying? And she said, because that man over there insulted my baby. He said, my baby was the ugliest baby in the world. And the man said, that's horrible. He said, if I was you, I'd go over there and slap him right now. She said, I think I will. He said, here, ma'am, I'll hold your monkey for you. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, I might not be the prettiest thing God ever made, but I'm prettier than a monkey. <laughs> Look at this. Look at this. You have a bendable thumb. Did you know that nothing else God made has a bendable thumb? You're the only thing God made. Look at your thumb and say, wow. Wow. That's remarkable. You see the pattern? What God did first was good, but what he did second was better than what he did first. And the angel said, oh, that's it. You've outdone yourself now, God. This is the best it could be. God said, uh-uh. And he put that man asleep. And he reached down and took out one of his ribs and made a woman. Somebody said if God made anything better than a woman, he kept it for himself. Can you ladies say amen tonight? Everything God does is better than what he did before. It exceeds abundant. How many of you here tonight would be so honest as to admit that you're competitive? How many competitive people are there here? Well, I've got to confess to you, I'm one of the least competitive people in the world, but I still enjoy winning. I'm not the kind of guy that has to win a checker game with a three-year-old. I know guys like that. Somebody said, it doesn't matter if you win or lose until you lose. Some people are at their very best, their very best when they're competitive. They can perform, they can out-excel, they can outdo themselves when they're competing with someone else. Have you ever wondered, perhaps not, who does God compete with? Who does God compete with? Does he compete with man? Oh, yeah. I can see this competition. Okay, God, let's see who can make the biggest universe, me or you. Who does God compete with? Does he compete with the devil? Oh, we got these silly songs about God and the devil in a boxing match, you know. And we're just waiting for the end to see who's going to win, God or the devil. You put the devil in a ring with God, and it's like putting me in the ring with Mike Tyson. The devil was a nuisance.
but he was never a threat. Did you hear me? He was never a threat. Who's going to compete with God? Let me tell you who. No one. Because God is one. God is one. There is none like him. He is one in his divine attributes. He is one in his knowledge. He is one in his love. He is one in his holiness. He is one in his righteousness. He is one in his power. He is one in his glory. There is no one like him. That's the reason in revival services like this, God is so willing to come down and share his righteousness, his holiness, his glory, and his power with us because he knows we're no competition. He's willing to share everything he has with us because he knows he's won. Then that brings us back to the question, who does God compete with? Listen to this scripture, Deuteronomy 6, 13. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cling and swear by his name. So we're instructed in the scriptures to swear by God's name. That doesn't mean cursing or profanity. It means we use the name of God. If we're to swear by God's name, whose name does God swear by? Isaiah 45, 23. He said, I have sworn by myself. The word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and it shall not return. In case you didn't get that, he repeated it over in the book of Hebrews. Chapter 6, verses 13 and 14, it says, For when God made promises to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, oh, I like that, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, Surely blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. The only name that God can swear by is his own name because there's no name greater than his name. And that answers our question. Who can God compete with? The only one God competes with is himself. And the only way God can compete with himself is to do what he's doing today better than what he did yesterday. Oh, I wish you could get a hold of this. You might shout if you could. I said, the first is better than the last. What God will do tomorrow is greater than what God did yesterday. Shh. You ain't seen nothing yet. The only way God can break his record is to do what he's already done but do it better when he does it again than he did it the first time he did it. He exceeds abundant. What God is doing today is always better than what God did yesterday. Look at the pattern. In the Old Testament, Elijah did miracles. Elisha did twice as many miracles. The last was better than the first. In the Old Testament, water came out of a rock. In the New Testament, Jesus said, If any man believe on me, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. The last is better than the first. In the Old Testament, the Hebrews were in the fire. In the New Testament, he put the fire in us. Glory to God. The last is better than the first. In the Old Testament, the Paschal Lamb's blood covered our sins. In the New Testament, the blood of the Lamb of God washes our sins away. The last is better than the first. In the Old Testament, God anointed priests and prophets and kings. In the New Testament, he said, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Glory be to God. What God is doing today is better than what 
everybody used to do. And I've got news for those of you that want to drag me back there. I've got news for those of you that want to drag me back to there. Leave my pork chops alone. There is a New Testament. There is a New Testament. Hebrews 8, 6 says, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. What God is doing now, Brother Wetzel, is better than what he did for Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He's given us the dispensation of his grace. The new is better than the old. When Jesus came, walked on this earth, gave his life for us, God exceeded abundant and made the last better than the first. You know the story. How about the wedding in Cana of Galilee? Oh, some of you knew I was going to get there, didn't you? They brought the pots in. Jesus' mother said, do whatever he tells you to do. They bought, brought the pots in full of water. And he said, pour out the water. And when they poured out the water, the water turned into wine. And they drank the wine. And the master of the feast said, what did he say? He said, you saved the best for last. You, oh, I want to tell you tonight, at Brownsville, Assembly of God, in 2002, God has saved the best for last. You haven't seen it all yet. God always does it. There's a pattern. In the dark ages, the church was marred in sin. They were selling indulgences. What that meant was they were literally selling the privilege to sin. Give so much money to help build St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, and if you gave the money, you could sin. The more you gave, the more you could sin. Give enough, you could get your sinful relatives out of purgatory. That's what indulgences were. And God birthed a great revival through a monk named Martin Luther. And Martin Luther preached, the just shall live by faith. And God did something better than what he had been doing for the church. And that message prevailed until the church grew cold. And finally, God raised up a man named John Wesley that began to preach a life of holiness and commitment to God. You see, Martin Luther brought us into faith, but then God said, I've got something better than that. And he added to faith holiness. And holiness was better than just the message of faith. And then after a while, God came down to a little ramshackled mission on Azusa Street. And to the holiness, God added power. He started with faith and he added holiness to faith and then he added power to holiness because everything God does is better than what he did before and what we're living in today is greater than what Martin Luther lived in and what we're living in today is greater than what John Wesley lived in and I'm here to tell you what we're living in today is greater than what William Joseph Seymour lived in because God always saves the best for last. In Joel chapter 2 and verse 23, it says, God will pour out the former rain and the latter rain. Most of us believe that former rain was what he poured out in Acts chapter 2. That former rain was what empowered the apostolic church. But the latter rain is what God is pouring out upon us, his people today. And I'm telling you, the latter rain is better than the former rain. The is the best. You might think this world's in a mess. And I believe you're right. I said, I believe you're right. The world is in a mess. When a court says in America, you can't say the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag because it's got God's name in it. We're in a mess. But you listen to me. You listen carefully. God's not up in heaven wringing his hands. Oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? 
What am I going to do with that mess down there in the world? God didn't say, okay, Trinity, we've got to get together today. We're going to have to have a special emergency meeting today. There's a mess down there in the world. We're going to have to get together and decide what we're going to do. Don't you think it for a minute? I said, don't you think it for a minute? When the devil is stirred up as much as he can stir up, like an actor in a ring throwing dust in the air when the devil has stirred up all that he can stir up. Used to watch when I was a kid those wrestlers, the old black and white wrestlers, watch them on television, and they'd get out there and prance around and, and do their stuff. You know, that's just like the devil. He's out there in the ring, and he's prancing around, and he's throwing dust up in the air, and he's making a real smell and a real stink about things but God hadn't even come out of his corner yet. And I'm telling you, when the devil has stirred up all that God lets him stir up, God's going to come out of his corner, and you ain't seen nothing yet. I said, the best is yet to come. God is going to send a mighty revival. The best is ahead. Look at the pattern. God will always do better tomorrow than he did yesterday. Oh, I hear some of you right now say, well, how's God going to top what he did at Brownsville? How's God going to top Father's Day 1995? I don't want to take anything away from what God has done in this church in a mighty revival. But I want to tell you, God was only practicing on Father's Day of 1995. God was only practicing. He's just getting ready for the main event. And I believe this world is about to see a move of God that will bring in a last day's harvest, that souls will be saved, that entire cities will be changed, that the world will hear the word of the Lord. Oh, glory be to God. Now, I've got a message for some of you whiners dragging along crying, I'm just so tired. If you're not careful, if you're not careful, all you're going to see, all you're going to see is the prologue, and you're going to miss the grand finale because God's not through yet. God's just getting started. <laughs> the glory that is about to come is greater than the glory that has come already. Jesus is back in the kitchen with water pots saying, somebody pour out some water because there's going to be new wine on the church. The best is coming yet. What God is about to do for the church is unparalleled. You say, well, how can you say that? Have you heard a prophecy? Do you have a word from the Lord? I have a word from the Lord. Look at how the church was born. I said, look at how the church was born. Peter stood and preached. 3,000 got saved in one sermon. The next day they went to the temple and there was a man that had been lame from his mother's birth or from his mother's womb from birth and they said, silver and gold have we none. Such as we have, we get. they took him by the hand and he jumped up and went leaping and running, walking and praising God. I said, that's how the church was born. You listening? Later it says, and they were added to the church daily, as many as should be saved. And then it says, their numbers were multiplied. The church was born in a mighty Holy Ghost revival. And how could God be God if the church that was born in revival left this world limping and crying and whining its way along to eternity? I said, what God's going to do for the rapture generation is greater than what he did for the Acts generation. The best is yet to come. Hallelujah! I'm about through, but listen to me. The church of the living God, that's you and I, the redeemed, the called out ones, the assembly 
is not going to limp off of planet Earth singing the doxology. We're going to leave this place with a shout and the power of God. God is about to come out of his corner and shake this world to its very foundation. In these last days, the sincere seekers of God will see him do more than they've ever witnessed before. So my final thought to you tonight is fasten your seatbelt. Put your serving tray in an upright and locked position because we're about to take off. The best is yet to come. If you believe it, stand on your feet and worship him right now. Hallelujah! Let's praise him again. Come on. Lift your voice. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless your name, Lord. Bless your name, Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Now, let me tell you what God's going to do with the rest of this service. In just a minute, we're going to have an altar call. That's what the Brownsville Revival is all about, an altar call and getting right with God. And then we'll pray for everyone that wants to receive prayer tonight. I'm going to ask those of you that are right here in the front, if you'll move your chairs, the ushers will be over to the sides to help you in just a minute because we want to give room for prayer tonight. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Somebody said, how are you going to give an altar call? You didn't preach a salvation message. Let me tell you, God doesn't even need my preaching to save your soul. <laughs> Hallelujah. Last night in our prayer meeting, we had prayer and then we worshiped the Lord. No sermon, no great fanfare, no long altar call. We just asked those that need to get right with God to come forward and I guess at least 20 people came forward to get right with God last night. That's because there's an open heaven in this house and God speaks to people's hearts. There are some of you here tonight, some of you don't even know why you're here. Somebody brought you here. Some of you young people, you sat through the conference and yet you've not yet yielded to the call or the voice of the Holy Spirit. And God brought you to this house tonight so that you can get right with him. And if you're here tonight and there's sin in your life, maybe you're here and you've never known God. Maybe you're here and you're bound by every kind of sin in the world. Maybe you're bound by drugs or alcohol, every kind of sin in the world. Or maybe you're here and you're a church member and you're in church every Sunday, but yet there's still those hidden sins in your heart. Sometimes sins like pride and sins like unforgiveness. Sometimes other sins, sexual sins, hidden in your heart. And God is speaking to you right now by the power of the Holy Ghost. And he's saying, you need to get right with me tonight. You see, I believe the best is yet to come, but some folks are going to get left behind. Some folks are going to miss that which is coming because their hearts are not right with God. God's looking for a people who are holy and pure, who have clean hands and pure hearts to pour his spirit out on in these last great days of revival. You're in this building right now. All over the house, every person I'm talking to you, in the balcony, on the main floor, if you're here and you need Jesus to forgive your sins tonight, maybe for the first time, maybe you've prayed this prayer a hundred times, but there's sin in your life tonight and you need forgiveness, I want you to put your hand up right now. Just put your hand up real high. God bless you tonight. I believe there's some others God speaking to you. Just put your hand up. You can put it up and back down. I'm going to pray for you. Me praying for you won't save you, but you're showing that you've got an interest in God right now. Who else? You'll put your hand up very quickly. Very quickly. Thank you, sir. Father God, I thank you for these that have lifted their hands tonight. Lord, I know these 
and many others in this house need to make things right with you tonight. They need to be washed in your blood, cleansed, Lord, from every wickedness. Set us free tonight. Lord, give these men and women, young people, the faith to step out towards you, knowing that you will meet them and forgive their sins. In Jesus' name, amen. No heads bowed tonight, no eyes closed. You lifted your hand, you need Jesus. Come on down here right now to the altar. Come on. You need the Lord. You lifted your hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Maybe you didn't lift your hand tonight, but you know you need to come. Come on. You don't have to come by yourself. Others are already coming. Come on down. Come on. Come on. Holiness is what I need. Hallelujah. We're waiting on you. Holiness, God bless you guys. Holiness is what you want from me. Now I need everybody in this building to do me a favor right now. I want you to turn to your neighbor. It might be your husband, wife, might be your pastor. It just doesn't matter. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, do you need Jesus to forgive your sins? If they say yes, I want you to take them by the hand and bring them down to the altar. Would you do that? Every person in the building, turn to your neighbor and say, do you need Jesus to forgive your sins? We're just casting the net one more time, trying to pull everyone in that needs to come. Thank God some more are coming. Can you praise the Lord? Take my heart. Thank you, Lord. And for me. Take my mind. Thank you, Lord. Transform me. Thank you, Lord. Take my will. Thank you, Lord. Conform me. Thank you, Lord. To Come on, church, they're still coming. Can you give God another round of applause and giving thanks tonight? Clap your hands, all you people. To my heart. Thank you, Lord. And for me. Take my mind. Thank you, Lord. Transform me. If you're listening to the service tonight on the radio or on the internet, if you need Jesus right now, you can ask Jesus to come into your heart. Change your life tonight. I want to ask everybody at the altar to stand with me, if you will, please. Everyone here, please stand. Thank you, Jesus. In just a minute, we have prayer team members that are going to come and pray with you. They'll pray with each one of you individually. But I want you to put your hand over your heart right now. We're going to pray a prayer. I'm going to ask everybody in the building to pray this prayer out loud to support these that are here at the altar. I want you to pray with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus Christ. I thank you that he lived. I thank you that he died. I thank you that he rose again to take my sins away. Forgive me of my sins tonight. Wash me in your blood. Write my name down in heaven. And right now, I make this vow. I will serve you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Lift your hands and give me thanks right now. Thank you for touching me.